Hi class, today we're going to talk about the muscular system. It's no surprise that you know that muscles contract and when they do that it allows you to move. There are about 650 muscles in the human body but that number does vary because different anatomists will separate them differently on where they start and where they end. It's kind of difficult to tell that sometimes. And your muscles and your muscular system, they comprise anywhere between a third or close to 40% to 50% of your total body mass. And that's because they are very dense with protein and protein is heavy. Your largest muscle is your gluteus maximus or your butt muscle. Your longest muscle is your sartorius, both those you need to know for your muscle ID. And the smallest, which you don't need to know, but it's just good to know it's the smallest. It's actually in your ear and it attaches to the smallest bone in your body, which is a stapes. So the muscle is called the stapedius. There are several functions that the muscular system has. The main one, of course, is movement, but most people think of movement as physical movement, you know, contracting your biceps and your triceps. That is a major movement, but movement also happens within your internal organs especially your digestive system and moving food through the different organs from one end to the other that also involves muscle it also involves moving anything else whether it be some sort of fluid like blood or lymph inside of your body that your body relies on muscle contractions for those movements as well your muscular system also provides heat so when muscles contract they produce heat they obviously help maintain posture and hold you up and they also stabilize joints because as we talked about that muscles attached to bones through tendons and those um, are also going to be located around your joints with the other ligaments and in general it's going to help stabilize those joints and protect them from injury. There are three different types of muscle. We talked about these when we were talked about tissue types in unit one, and they include cardiac, skeletal, and smooth. So let's talk about each one of these a little bit more in detail. The first one is skeletal muscle tissue. So as a reminder, skeletal muscle are the muscles that you think of, like your biceps and triceps, when you think of muscle. And they're called skeletal muscle because they attach to your skeleton or to your bones. And that's done by tendons. So what will happen is that the muscle will kind of taper off and this connective tissue called a tendon will insert somewhere on a skeletal bone. Now, these types of muscles in your body are voluntary, which means that you can consciously control when you contract and relax them. So you can control that, we call that voluntary. When you look at the tissue, or actually the cells, under a microscope, they are striated. And in science, striated means striped. And so if you look at the picture that I have over there, you can see these striations or stripes going down the length of those muscle cells, the skeletal muscle cells. Also, this is something that a lot of people don't realize, but there are certain types of cells that actually have more than one nucleus. We call them multinucleated, and skeletal muscle cells are one of those types. And finally, the general shape of skeletal muscles is really long and tube-like or cylindrical, and that's going to actually help them contract better. And we call skeletal muscle cells muscle fibers, and we're gonna talk about how they contract in a little bit. The second type of muscle tissue is called smooth, and smooth muscle tissue typically lines the organs of your body. Typically a lot of hollow organs, your digestive organs like your stomach, your intestines, uh, reproductive organs like your uterus, or um, urinary ones like your bladder, your blood vessels, to, again, move things through. There has to be smooth muscle to contract and relax to make those organs function. They are involuntary, so you cannot actually control food moving through your intestines, for example, kind of happens on its own, so they are involuntary. Their general cell shape is spindle-shaped, and if you look at the picture down here, you could see that, you know, spindles kind of tapered off on the ends and a little bit thicker in the middle. They only have a single nucleus, and they do not have those striations on them, so they are non-striated. The last type of muscle tissue is called cardiac muscle tissue, and with the name, I hope that you realize that this is the muscle that makes up your heart. And this is involuntary, so you cannot control your heartbeat. You could indirectly speed it up or slow it down, but you can't control it. It's going to go on beating. So involuntary, 
Under a microscope, cardiac muscle cells are striated, so they have those striations or stripes on them, as you can see from the pictures. But their cells, unlike the skeletal muscle cells, which are tubular and cylindrical, these actually branch out. So they have more branching and more like gaps between the two. And finally, they also, like smooth muscle, only have a single nucleus. And so those are going to help regulate your heartbeat. And when we get to the circulatory system and talk about the heart, we're going to bring back up cardiac muscle tissue. So overall, there's three muscle tissue types, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. We're mainly going to be focusing on skeletal muscle and how it contracts. First, before we talk about the physiology on how the contraction happens, we need to talk about the anatomy. So when we zoom down in on muscle, what is an actual muscle comprised of? So we're going to take a muscle, the bicep, and the bicep, we're going to break it down into pieces or sections, and then those sections into smaller sections into smaller sections, into smaller and smaller sections. So I always think of Russian dolls when I teach this and how these kind of stack into each other. So we're gonna start with the big muscle and find out what makes that up, and then what makes that up, what makes that up, and we're gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller until we get down to the contracting functional unit, the part that's actually doing those contractions that make your muscle sy mu muscular system work. So first, we're going to start with the actual skeletal muscle. So I use the bicep in this example, so let's take that again. Pretend that this is your bicep brachii muscle. And if you look over here, here's the actual bone, and it's going to be attached through a tendon. So muscles attached to bone through tendons. And this entire thing is the actual skeletal muscle, but we're going to break it down into parts. Skeletal muscle is broken up into groups or sections called fascicles. And fascicles are shown in this picture. You could actually well, see them. Here's one fascicle right here. I'm going to try to circle it. Here's one that they actually pulled out. Here's another one. So there's a bunch of them here. So these are the fascicles. There's a group of these fascicles that will make up the skeletal muscle. The fascicles are made up of smaller parts called fibers. In the muscular system, fibers are also known as cells. So when I say muscle fibers, that's the same thing as a muscle cell. And so in this picture, we're taking one fascicle and then we're pulling out this long skinny piece right here and that is the muscle fiber or the muscle cell. So again, we have the muscle, which is broken up into fascicles and the fascicles are broken up into muscle cells called fibers. But it even gets more complex. If we look at the inside of a muscle cell or a muscle fiber, it's actually broken into cell parts, a type of organelle called myofibrils. So the prefix myo means muscle, sarco means muscle too. But myofibrils, these are ribbon-like organelles that are inside of muscle cells. Those are made up of proteins called myofilaments. So these myofilaments are these long contracting proteins. And there's two major types of myofilaments. They're called actin and myosin. And these are the ones that are going to actually do the work of the contractions. But they're separated into sections or units called sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are the part that's actually getting shorter and longer with each contraction as the actin and myosin are literally sliding across each other. So they, con they connect, they pull on each other, and they get shorter. And what's actually getting shorter is this thing called a sarcomere. So we can call the sarcomere the functional unit of the muscle or the muscular system. That means it's the part that's doing the job. And the job of muscle is to contract. And if we look at this picture, so we have up here, this is the muscle fiber or cell. Here's the myofibrils, which are those long organelles inside. And if we zoom in on one of those, it's this long cylindrical thing made of two proteins called actin and myosin. Actin is usually thin and my, myosin is a fat band. So looking down here, they're kind of labeled as actin and myosin. The red ones are myosin and these bluish purple ones are actin. 
and they're separated into sections. So from here to here, that is one sarcomere. So this is one sarcomere. From this line to this line, here's another sarcomere. And what's going to happen is that each of those sections gets shorter with each contraction. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But first, let's look at the picture. This is the picture that I put on, I believe, your notes. It's a little bit blurry. I'm sorry for that. But here's the bone, and here's the tendon connecting the bone and the muscle. Here's the skeletal muscle, which is broken up into fascicles. Fascicles contain fibers. Fibers contain fibrils. So here's yet another picture, just a different view. I think it's important to go over these more than once because it is kind of confusing. So the tendon connects bone to muscle, and the muscle tissue, which is shown right here, is made out of bundles called fascicles. You can see one being pulled out of there. And then fascicles are made of cells called fibers, muscle fibers, and one is being pulled out here. And the muscle cells or the muscle fibers have organelles called myofibrils that make them up. As you can see, there's some stuff that we're not responsible for, but in an anatomy and physiology, physiology course that you were to take, they would go into more detail and you would learn about fascia, which is the connective tissue that holds muscle to muscle, or epimesium, perimesium, endomesium, and a few other things. These are parts that kind of wrap, they're kind of wrappings around different areas of the muscle that you're not responsible for knowing. So the myofibril, right? But that myofibril can be broken up into proteins called myofilaments. So yet another picture, just do it again. Here's the tendon, bone to muscle. The muscle, the skeletal muscle is broken up into fascicles, which are bundles of muscle cells. And these muscle cells are called fibers. And then the muscle fiber has these organelle type things called myofibrils that make them up. And the myofibrils are made of special proteins called myofilaments. And there's two types called actin and myosin. So tendon, fascicle, fiber, fibril, and then we have these proteins called actin and myosin, which it's zooming up in here. And the two that we see are actin and myosin. So we have actin and we also have myosin in green and purple and the myosin are thick and the actin are thin, they will attach to each other. And they do that within a section called a sarcomere. So from this blue line to this blue line, that's a sarcomere. From this blue line to that one, there's a sarcomere, 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 sarcomere. So there's sections that go down the myofilament of actin and myosin. And each of these sections will contract and get shorter as the actin and myosin pull on each other. And so we need to talk about kind of how that happens a little bit. First, you need something to stimulate your muscle cells, your muscle fibers. That's done through your nervous system. So a nerve will stimulate your muscle. When that happens, a very important thing is released and that is calcium. And the calcium allows the actin and myosin to attach to each other. Usually they're not touching, but when calcium's around, it allows them to actually grab onto each other. And then we also need some ATP around because ATP is going to allow them to pull on each other after they connect to each other. So they connect and then they have to pull on each other to slide to cause that contraction. And those two things are very important and necessary. When they pull on each other, they actually pull to the center of the sarcomere, which is where the contract is, is what the contraction actually is. So this picture is showing before they pull on each other, the actin and myosin, and you could see that now the sarcomere got shorter because with the help of ATP and calcium, the actin and myosin slid right across and shortened to, to contract. This is just a different picture showing a zoomed in picture of the actin and the myosin filaments. So when they're relaxed, they're not touching. When the nerve stimulates the muscle fibers, what happens is calcium and ATP allow them to kind of attach and pull, and that causes them to contract. 
It's called the sliding filament theory. I really hope that you remember that ATP is chemical energy of cells, and there's a picture of it. And if you remember that when the third phosphate group gets broken off, then the energy is released, and that turns into an ADP molecule, adenosine diphosphate, and the phosphate got removed. It'll be, get reattached in one way or another eventually. So the last thing we have to talk about is where does this stuff come from to allow for muscle contractions? And the first thing that we need for contractions is calcium. Most of your calcium is stored in your bones. So you need osteoclasts, those special bone cells that break down bone material to release the calcium. We talked about those in the skeletal system. There is a little calcium stored in your muscles, but most of it is stored in your bones. Then we need ATP, which is that chemical cellular energy. And there's a few places that we could get it. The main place, of course, is good old cellular respiration that happens in the mitochondria that we talked about in bio a few years ago, where we take mainly glucose. There's a few other molecules like fatty acids and amino acids that can also be broken down into ATP, but your body's favorite is always glucose. And this is gonna supply long-term energy as the glucose is slowly broken down and ADP is phosphoric related, which means the third phosphate is added back on to create ATP. This is going to give us long-term energy. But on the short-term level, for bursts of energy, there's actually two ways that we could, we could get a little bit more ATP. A, anaerobic respiration is without oxygen. And the two anaerobic things that happen are glycolysis, which is actually the first step of respiration, and it does not require oxygen, and it makes a little bit of ATP without oxygen, so it is anaerobic. And then there's lactic acid fermentation that produces lactate or lactic acid. That's that burning in your muscles that occurs during a strenuous quick activity. And that's why this energy is good for short term, less than a minute. And then finally, one that you probably didn't hear about before, unless you're into fitness, there's creatine phosphate. So this is a supplement that's usually taken before or during a workout. And what will happen, it will create an instant supply of phosphate. And the phosphate will detach from the creatine and then be available to phosphorylate ADP into, back into ATP. And this is so readily available so quickly that this is going to allow for very short-term energy boosts. So very intense, short, quick bursts of movement. And so these are the three main places where ATP can come from. This is just a picture showing it more in detail where we have creatine phosphate supplying phosphate to phosphorylize ATP. We have anaerobic pathways like glycolysis and lactic acid that produce fairly short, less than a minute bursts of energy. And then we have the good old fashioned aerobic respiration, which is old faithful, happens in the mitochondria and constantly produces ATP. And it's mainly used for long-term energy storages. And that's it about the muscular system. I hope you learned something and I'll see you later. Bye.